Hello, my name is Jane Robinson and it's an honour to be with you. I wish I was there in body as well as spirit, but maybe next time. I'd like to talk to you about my most recent book, Ladies Can't Climb Ladders, which is out in paperback this month, actually, um, March. So I'd like you to picture, if you will, an early spring evening exactly 101 years ago. It's March 1920. It's unseasonably cold. There's already a promise of frost in the air as small groups of women begin to arrive through the gas-lit dusk at the Palace of Westminster. Three or four stride confidently, neat and slim in loose-fitting coats with hems well above the ankle and close-brimmed hats. The rest walk more slowly. Their costumes are structured on old-fashioned lines. Their fur stoles dangle the limbs and snouts of long-dead foxes, and their hats are as wide as their hips. It would be difficult, perhaps, at first glance to imagine what brings this unlikely company of women together. Business is over for the day at the House of Commons. It's 700 odd members, all men but one, have grappled with the fate of a military mission in Soviet Russia, the employment of ex-servicemen, how children should be provided with medical care at school, and the parlous state of the house's ventilation system. Further afield, the country struggles to come to terms with the aftermath of war and the recent pandemic of the Spanish flu. This was a cruel blow to a country just beginning to raise its head above the parapet and to look to the future. I never thought when I wrote this that we would know what they mean by that. No family is untouched by grief. Some have reacted to personal loss that by telling themselves that all that matters is to live for the day. Others disapprove of such hedonism, preferring instead to trust in the pre-war values that built the British Empire. Those ladies gathering in Westminster that early spring evening in 1920 represent a third way. Between them, they're changing the world for British women at home, in politics and in the workplace. Radiant with the partial success of recent crusades for the vote and for university degrees and the right to a career, they have come to celebrate. Among the first to turn up at the banquet is Ray Strachey on the left here. She's a veteran of the suffrage campaign and a progressive champion of women in the traditional professions. Not that there are many women in the traditional professions at this stage. There's a few score doctors and surgeons, seasoned by war work, but unwelcome in most teaching hospitals. There are some pretend engineers and architects whose unfeminine ambition makes right-minded people laugh. A handful of unorthodox priestesses, recalling Samuel Johnson's famous quip that a woman's preaching is like a dog ward walking on its hinder legs. It's not done well, but one's surprised to see it done at all. And there are thousands and thousands of women teachers. But until the end of the Second World War, they are expected to resign upon marriage, which means the average working life for a teacher, the average length of her career, is three years. A couple of fully fledged professors have been appointed, one at some Johnny-come-lately university and the other at a ladies medical school, so they hardly counted, and there are no qualified barristers or solicitors at all. The venue of this evening's celebration, the Houses of Parliament, is particularly gratifying to Ray's suffragist friend and mentor Millicent Garrett Fawcett on the right. Walking into Parliament by invitation remains a novelty for her. Memories of past suffragette violence and despair still stir the corridors of power, and it seems strange to be hailed as a heroine by the other guests, the Lord Chancellor, Solicitor General among them. Mrs Fawcett is in her 73rd year. Most of the other women at the banquet are younger including the bespectacled Helena Normanton on the left here, 
who will become one of the first two females in Britain to take silk. Her almost exact contemporary is Lady Rhonda in the middle. She was an extraordinarily energetic businesswoman and political activist from Wales. And then there's a young wife and mother on the right called Gwyneth Bebb Thompson. Officially, this event was to celebrate the passing of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, the SDRA, a few weeks previously on the 23rd of December 1919. It was also to launch a loan fund for women hoping to study for the law now that the act had made it possible for them to do so. But in many ways, the whole celebration was all about Gwyneth. Gwyneth Bebb Thompson was one of seven children. She was educated at home in Wales and then at a boarding school in London before going up to St Hugh's College in Oxford in 1908. At the time it was called St Hugh's Hall, it wasn't yet a proper college. There she was one of the first women to study jurisprudence or the theory and philosophy of law. Why did she choose what was almost exclusively a male discipline? It was a rash decision really because women were not committed anywhere near the legal profession at the time and she always knew that she would have to earn her living. And why Oxford, which refused to confer degrees on its female students until persuaded to do so by the SDRA, that Act of Parliament, in 1920. Had she been a man, Gwyneth's exam results would have pocketed her a first class degree. And more than that, she would have been acknowledged as one of the highest achievers of her year. As it was, she left university with nothing more tangible than a warm glow of achievement which isn't particularly helpful when you're applying for posts alongside men with strings of letters after their names. In 1913, Gwyneth sued the Law Society for refusing to admit women to train for the legal profession. She lost both the case and a subsequent appeal on the Alice in Wonderland grounds that, as women had never been admitted before, there was no precedent, and without a precedent, they couldn't be admitted. This was a very common argument against allowing women in any of the six traditional professions, academia, architecture, the church, engineering, law and medicine. They called it the law of inveterate usage. It had never been done, therefore it could never be done. During the First World War, Gwyneth married Thomas Weldon Thompson, a solicitor, and worked for the Ministry of Food before the birth of their first child, Alice Diana, on the very day the SDRA received royal assent in 1919. By now she changed her mind and wished to read for the bar rather than being a solicitor. Her application to Lincoln's Inn was accepted the following day on Christmas Eve. Gwyneth was asked to propose a toast at that House of Commons celebration. In her speech, she promised that if ever she were required to wear a wig in the course of her legal duties, she tried to arrange her hair so that it didn't look too ridiculous. Not for her own sake, mind, nothing to do with vanity, but to preserve the dignity of her new profession. Then she repeated a comment that had been made to her by a fellow male trainee, that unless she could drink a pint of ale and a bottle of port at dinner, it was useless to expect to be admitted to any of the inns of court. An uncomfortable pause was adroitly broken by her admission that she had got away with quaffing ginger beer instead. She was grateful for the welcome that she'd been given at Lincoln's Inn, she said, and she looked forward with confidence to the future. Perhaps she was naive. Because stodgy arguments against women in the professions had been circulating for years and were no less popular now than they'd ever been despite the passing of the SDRA. Gentlemen would never stoop to taking orders from women for example. It was degrading, flew in the face of nature. Women were somehow unsexed by gentlemen's work. Old school doctors warned that thinking too much withered the womb. Some were refused high caliber posts on the grounds of being too plain, others explicitly because they were too pretty, distractingly pretty. 
And then there was the perennial claim that women couldn't possibly work in a man's world because nobody had installed any ladies' laboratories there. The smoking rooms of professional societies, associations, institutions and clubs rumbled with self-righteous discontent at the thought of a petticoat invasion, while senior common rooms in the ancient universities refused to appoint women whose mercurial, volatile, hysterical teaching methods might interfere, as they put it, with the proper education of young men. The SDRA did prompt action in some quarters, not only were the inns of court minded to admit women, but in October 1920, Oxford University decided to award its female students degrees for the first time. There have been ladies there since 1879, this was 1920. Cambridge infamously resisted giving its women undergraduates degrees until 1948. Despite the act, however, this was in many ways the worst time for women like Gwyneth to think of entering the professions. Though they had won temporary respect and valuable experience by metaphorically donning bowler hats and pinstripes or overalls and grease guns during the First World War, priority, understandably, was now being given to returning servicemen while their wives and daughters, their sisters and mothers, were expected to unfold their pinnies and withdraw once again to the kitchen. So it's a myth really that the First World War liberated women in the long term. Expediency meant that they were given the taste of independent careers, but socio-economic pressures ensured that in peacetime the old order was very reluctant to change. Lip service was paid in the form of the SDRA, but the professional world was still very sclerotic, rigid in the years that followed, hide bound by convention, defensive and frankly scared of competition. None of this daunted Gwyneth Bebb Thompson. As a young mother, still employed by the Ministry of Food, she dutifully ate her regulation dinners at, the, um, at Lincoln's Inn, and she passed the necessary exams by studying in the evenings during her first year. Remember, she was a new mother as well. The future did indeed look bright if she worked hard enough and she was already a dignified role model for her companions embarking on a world in the professions. It wasn't easy. Barrister Helena Normanton here was accused of willfully attracting attention to herself when journalists followed her every move and shadowed the progress of every hard-won brief this modern Porsche achieved. How vulgar she is, commented her reactionary colleagues. How silly women like her are. Their brains are tiny compared to ours. Physically, they spend a quarter of their best years mired in Eve's curse. Mentally, they're illogical, inherently biased, they're bitchy to one another, they're flirtatious with men, they're completely unreliable. They share a peculiarly feminine trait, and I quote here, of seeing through a stone wall what is not on the other side. And to top it all, they eat all the cheese at regulation dinners. These are all genuine arguments against women lawyers, even the one about the cheese, and they're transferable to women in every profession, which I still find quite difficult to credit. It must have been so hard, on top of passing all the necessary exams and trying to find clients without appearing strident or pushy, for these women pioneers to keep their cool when faced with playground prejudice like this. The title of my book, Ladies Can't Climb Ladders, comes from an argument wielded quite triumphantly by male architects against women attempting to enter their profession. At a high level meeting when the act was passed, somebody suddenly came up with this blindingly obvious answer to their problems. It's okay boys, they said. Everyone knows that ladies can't climb ladders. Therefore, they can't be architects. And if one or two do manage to work out what to do with their delicate little ankles and their skirts on all those rungs, they're bound to lose their heads and plummet messily to the ground from the scaffolding. 
possibly displaying their underclothing as they do so. This must not be allowed to happen. While we're at it, on the theme of um, <laughs> unlikely prejudice, here's a little ditty published in a medical school journal in the early 20th century, a generation after Dr Elizabeth Blackwell, Dr Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, Dr Sophia Jex Blake qualified. Here we go. Though all the world's a stage and we are acting, yet still I think your part is not dissecting. To me, the art of making apple tarts would suit you better than those horrid parts. Your knowledge of the frog should only be how they're cooked in France and making tea. And as for learning chemistry and that, it would be a nicer thing to trim a hat. I know your aims in medicine are true, but tell me, is there any need of you? I wish the lad who'd written that had met Ida Mann. The popular image of the pioneering career woman is of a loud eccentric set apart from mere mortals by genius and grim determination, a sort of modern boudicca riding roughshod over convention to lead a growing army of formidable females to storm the citadels of the establishment and shatter the glass ceilings within. Most of my heroines in this book are nothing like that. They are you and me, but more intrepid and with none of the advantages we have because of what they did. However, Ida Mann is in every way a woman apart. Ida's father encouraged her intelligence up to a point. He paid her for achieving good exam results, but he withdrew her from school at 16 as a matter of principle, consigning her instead to a commercial college where she was expected to prepare for a job in the post office savings bank. She did as she was told, because you did in those days, and she got the job but she hated it. One day she was invited to visit the London hospital after supporting a fundraising event. Ida was excited by the prospect. She'd always been keen on dolls as a child, not dressing them up in frilly frocks and having pretend tea parties, but plonking them down in disarray on makeshift beds in pretend wards and dosing them with potions and a sadistic lintonari. Not the best attitude perhaps for a doctor to her patients, but Ida's visit to the London hospital convinced her that a career in medicine was what her life was going to be all about. She made herself an appointment to see those in charge of student admissions at the London School of Medicine for Women. Appropriately enough, it's now um, a modern medical centre. And she got herself a place passing the matriculation exam in the first division. She was ecstatic and her parents, while surely dazed by her proactivity, paid what they could to help her on her way. Ida devised herself a uniform for work. It comprised a Norfolk jacket with loads and loads of pockets for various bits and bobs of medical equipment and spare bones and a stout skirt. My suit, she said, was designed to last for years and was varied by different shirts and violently coloured stockings of emerald green and scarlet or purple. She had her own skeleton, probably dug as most were at the time from the battlefields of the Napoleonic Wars. Her teachers were exceedingly strong characters. One of them was Sir Amroth Wright, a notorious misogynist who appears as a sort of anti-hero in several of my books, actually. He was a virulent anti-suffragist and altogether terrifying. Ida was unfazed. She nicknamed Sir Amroth Wright, Sir Almost Wright, and was amused rather than offended that he managed never to speak directly to a female medical student ever. Sir Amroth, like the psychiatrist Sir Henry Maudsley, was one of those old school physicians who considered females physiologically and emotionally incapable of any meaningful intellectual activity. Maudsley's famous argument was that women had a finite amount of life force in their bodies and that if they spent it all thinking, then there would be none left over for reproduction for their natural function in life and their wounds would atrophy. By the time Ida was studying medicine in the 1920s, however, no concessions were being made to any supposed frailty. Ida appears to have had the constitution of an ox, 
but even she got exhausted occasionally. During her training in domiciliary midwifery when she was on call for home confinements, the lack of sleep was almost overwhelming. One ghastly morning, she remembered, I was pedalling along with a splitting headache, the leg of my pyjama pants hanging below my skirt, and a dead baby in a brown paper parcel on the carrier. This was a different age, remember. When my bicycle wheel got caught in a tramline and I was catapulted into the mud. The parcel with its grim contents was also flung into the road. And just as Ida was picking herself up and about to retrieve it, a policeman arrived and started asking questions. Ida went on to become a legend in her field of ophthalmology and the first female professor at the University of Oxford. Do read about her courtship in the book, by the way, if you get a chance. I promise you a surprise when you hear what she and her future husband did to amuse themselves in private. And talking of romance, the number and profile of women working in the professions began to grow during the 1920s and the 1930s. Alongside that, so did the market for their newfound disposable income. I had huge fun researching women's magazines of the interwar period with appropriately situated love stories and articles and advertisements targeted at the modern salary earning girl. She was a new phenomenon, really. Here's a very quick selection of some of my favourites. Forgive me if I look away from the camera for a minute because my screen is to the side, um, but I'd like to just chat about some of the images you'll see. So we have some advertisements here. Uh, you certainly don't want grey hairs to be showing when you're at work because people might think you're too old to be in the office. So you must use Vivatone radioactive hair restorer to solve the problem. The advertisement in the middle um, is for Shell Petrol. Of course, when women started earning a salary, then uh, people started thinking mm, they're going to be able to spend this on things that will further their independence. How about a little car? And if they had a little lady's car, they would want fuel to put in it. Obviously, Shell is the one to buy because if you buy Shell, you will look like the very attractive lady on the left. If you don't, you will look like the one on the right. I think my favourite cartoon ever is the one in the bottom right hand corner with the uh, gentleman and one lady sitting around the boardroom table. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs, says the chairman. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. One of the first books I came across when I was researching Ladies Can't Climb Ladders was this one, Bobbed Hair, Bossy Wives and Women Preachers, which is a sort of cautionary tale against ambitious women. Some lovely pictures there as well. And then insulting on so many levels is a newspaper uh, clipping on the right which is reporting degree day for some women medical students just let me quickly read you uh, some of the text underneath young students of the london school of medicine for women attend the inauguration of a new session in cap and gown and a very striking lot they are all alert and self-possessed, a large number are sufficiently good looking to have no need of cosmetics, which naturally they eschew. Just think about it on many, many levels. That is insulting. And this needs no commentary from me. These are all from magazines and various media that, that were available to all. But of course, each of the professions had its own in-house journal. And one of the best is The Woman Engineer, which is still going strong. Published quarterly by the Women's Engineering Society from 1919 onwards, it's full of fascinating information and spirited, endlessly energetic personalities. Reading it is like peering through the window of a bustling workshop, peopled by women who individually and together, physically and metaphorically, are constructing a new world. I wonder if you recognise this one. She's usually seen in a much more glamorous pose, but this is, of course, Amy Johnson, who was first and foremost an aeronautical engineer. She was president of the ladies, uh, the Women's Engineering Society for at least one term. 
and here on the right is Margaret Partridge from Devon, who joined a firm of consulting engineers in 1917, specialising in heating and ventilation. Not very glamorous. She was initially employed to work in the office, but before long was out on the shop floor as a supervisor and a tester at an electrical factory making searchlights and X-ray machines. She moved on to designing small electric engines, as you do, and might have stayed at the factory had not the gates been effectively closed to women when surviving servicemen returned from the war. The same happened at medical schools, by the way, though open to women during the First World War, most, in London at least, closed their doors to women in the 1920s and didn't admit them again for another 20 years. Rather than retreat to the office, the classroom, or worse still, the front parlour, Margaret Partridge went home to Devon and advertised herself in the local papers as a country house lighting engineer. She offered consultations by appointment and by 1927 had won the distinction, somewhat niche it's true, of being the first woman to wire an English village for electric light. Working with hard-won financial backers and eventually employing several members of staff and training her own female apprentices, Margaret brought electricity to entire villages across Devon and in Suffolk. She built power plants, connecting houses and businesses to them so efficiently that everyone in the community who'd signed up to her scheme had merely to flick a switch and lo and behold, it took only an hour for the electricity to leap, fly, jump, whatever it did, from the plant to their homes. It was miraculous. Before lighting people's houses, Margaret illuminated the streets outside. In Bampton, when she first turned on the street lamps in 1926, it was always a dramatic moment that villagers ran from their homes to gasp in astonishment. One man decided to spend his evening sitting under a lamppost, reading his paper rather than in his own front room. Once Margaret turned her attention inside, children were so terrified by the glare in their newly lit bedrooms that for several nights they screamed and refused to be left alone with the light on. Meetings were held to complain about this weird woman and her miles of cables until she proved what magical things she and her cables could do. As a woman in charge of her own enterprise, the first member of the Women's Engineering Society to be so, Margaret encountered plenty of male employees in the course of her business. Naturally shy and well aware of the old argument that it was unseemly for a woman to give a man orders, she quickly worked out, and I quote, that a judicious administration of praise and appealing to a man's pride in his job and capabilities, flattery in other words, will do far more towards getting the best out of anyone than all the vigilant strictness of the most powerful martinet. Salesmen jostling to supply components for her machinery were some of the hardest people to deal with, thinking that they could get the better of her. As a rule, she said, a salesman is not fit to do business with till he has been properly squashed. One of the joys of researching this book was the discovery of an intricate network among the pioneers for mutual support. The Women's Engineering Society engaged en uh, lawyer, I beg your pardon, Helena Normanton as their legal advisor. We've already seen her, she was the one in the specs. A more than one woman doctor commissioned architect and stylish ladder climber, Gertrude Levicus to design not only their hospitals, but their private houses. In 1915, when she was only 17, Gertrude had been the first woman officially to enrol at London University's Bartlett School of Architecture. Her gender was not her only handicap. This was 1915, not a good time to have a German name and German parents. Gertrude had been born in Oldenburg but brought up in South London. And she was seriously myopic. Her mother wept, literally, at the thought that her daughter would never marry because who would want a wife barely able to see her hand in front of her face without wearing an ugly pair of spectacles? Fortunately, Gertrude was not vain. 
Her world changed the moment she fixed the wiry arms of her first pair of spectacles behind her ears and clearly saw a robin. She was entranced. What does the lack of a husband matter to me, she said. The recalcitrant, fierce father is a familiar figure in the history of ambitious women. He appears often unfairly as a sort of pantomime villain virtually locking up his Cinderella daughter to while away that inconvenient period between school and marriage. Mr Otto Levicus was different. It was he who persuaded Gertrude to become an architect after reading about the possibility of women becoming architects in the paper one Saturday morning. The luckiest thing that ever happened to her, according to Gertrude, was being taken on as a pupil in 1919 by Horace Field, a highly respected neoclassical architect working in London. And so many of the people in my book would not even have got on the first rung of the ladder without the support of men either in the professions or in their families. It's important to remember that. So Horace Field signed um, Gertrude's application form for associate membership of REBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. It's not a great reproduction this, but you might see where he and him have had to be manually crossed out and she and her put in instead. I don't think REBA changed its forms incidentally um, until the 1970s. So every woman who applied had the indignity of crossing out he and him. By now, Gertrude had a degree under her belt, experience in draftsmanship, gained through a holiday job, illustrating a book on classical architecture, and a genuine love of the career that her father had chosen for her. She produced a few, what she called, smallish country houses for friends and family. Lady Rhonda, who'd been at that House of Commons dinner back in March 1920, she commissioned Gertrude to work on a very fancy drainage scheme and some alterations to her place in Kent. After the Second World War, Gertrude worked on prefabricated homes for the East End and she designed and built the majestic Finchley Road shopping parade in North London with retail units below and flats above. She refused to be pigeonholed, as many women architects were in the early days, as some fancy sort of interior designer. After a long career and a long retirement, Gertrude moved into a nursing home in Hove. To most of us, the phrase a nursing home in Hove conjures up an image of quiet gentility with residents resting in high-backed floral armchairs, reflecting on the past while waiting for luncheon at noon. For Gertrude, it was no such thing. Proactive all her life, she was obviously frustrated by the thought of sitting still for the rest of her days, even into her 80s. What could she do to allay the boredom? Well, what had she done all her life? She took paper, a pen and her drawing board and she completed a detailed architectural plan of the building. It's beautiful and I find it strangely moving. Once an architect, it seems always an architect. She must have been very proud of who she was and what she did. I've already said that 2020 marked the centenary of women being granted degrees at Oxford. So it seems appropriate to tell you about an Oxford academic who was there at the time, the incomparable Enid Starkey. Enid would turn up to tutorials as the tutor, dressed as a Breton matelot. Her face made up with white powder and a gash of scarlet lipstick, smoking a cigarette, I imagine a Gauloise, une gitane. She was not remotely French, but she was a great linguist with an international reputation for scholarship. She was the first person, not just the first woman, but the first person to achieve a D-lit, a sort of super doctorate in the Faculty of Modern Languages at Oxford. It's hard to imagine her as anything other than a flamboyant and somewhat distrait academic, and yet she denied ever having had the slightest inclination to teach anyone anything. Enid spoke French with a heavy Irish accent, which added to the bemusement of her students. As a troubled child, she found joy in reading French literature. 
and in music. Her ambition while she was a schoolgirl in Dublin was to become a concert pianist. There was no doubt she would have to earn her living somehow. An unspecified financial catastrophe during her second term as an undergraduate at Somerville College in Oxford in 1917, left her father facing ruin and Enid having to survive on an extremely meagre budget. It was quite fashionable for students at the time to claim a picturesque state of poverty as they sat on brightly patterned rugs in their rooms, sipping cocoa at cocoa parties or perhaps even the old glass of sherry. Enid really was living on the breadline though. She shunned cocoa parties because she couldn't afford to return invitations. She barely possessed a change of clothes and was once seen poking about the snow in her nightdress, hunting for a precious hairpin dropped on the way from the bath to her distant bedroom. But she had style and panache. As an undergraduate, she once released a big red balloon at a formal dinner it's unclear whether it was safely tied and floated gracefully to the vaulted ceiling of Somerville's dining hall or whether she left it loose to skim flatulently over people's heads. I rather suspect and hope the latter. On another occasion, she successfully smuggled two men in drag into breakfast. Her peers were in awe of her showmanship. They called her the wild Irish woman an image enhanced by a slight squint and a fondness for wearing chrysanthemums in her scribbly hair. Rapturously in love with Gide and Rimbaud and Baudelaire, Enid managed to scrape together enough funds after finals to take her to the Sorbonne in Paris, where she won a place to study for a research degree, quite an uncommon thing for a woman at the time. Her doctoral thesis on a Belgian poet was awarded a prize in 1927, which led to her appointment as a lecturer in French literature back at Somerville at Oxford. During this time, she suffered from malnutrition and was involved in a series of intense but doomed love affairs with men and women. Getting the post at Somerville must have seemed a bit like entering a safe haven after a lifetime on stormy seas. Enid did not do calm, however. Her rented flat in Oxford was done up like a high-class oriental brothel, all red and gold and curlicues, and there was a permanent haze of cigarette smoke. When not dressed as a sailor, she would wear a Chinese trouser suit, looking a little like an extravagant pair of silk pyjamas. Her fingers clanked softly with silver rings and her tutorial students were as likely to be asked about their carnal knowledge as about the nuances of French expression. She courted academic controversy and was rarely conciliatory. And yet many students remembered her with fondness and her forget-me-not blue eyes and subtly wicked smile still greet some villains as they trudge up the library stairs towards her portrait. She remains resplendent in scarlet. So much for the traditional image of the frumpy virgin academic supposed to have occupied the few positions available to highly qualified women in universities before the Second World War. If there's anything that my heroines in this book have in common, it is their necessary refusal to conform, a rebellion that most of them conducted with grace, high spirits and success. It's been a really joyful exercise researching this book, eye-opening, shocking at times, but overwhelmingly inspiring. One of the most inspiring and surprising characters of all is Maud Royden an unordained clergywoman whose life story and love story really need to be made into a film. There are precious few church women in the book for obvious reasons. Constance Coltman is there as a pioneering Congregationalist minister with the Baptist preacher Violet Hedger and Unitarian Gertrude von Petzold. I follow the arguments in the book for those in favour of women in the church and those against women in the church, each party quoting from the Bible to support their cause. But you'll remember that the first female bishop was not ordained in the Anglican Church until 2015. And as for the Catholic Church, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. 
But more Droiden makes up in quality what we lack in quantity. If you get a chance to read the book, don't miss Maud, because I think knowing about her has changed me, certainly as a historian. This is, of course, a history book, but more than any other book I've written, I think, it's also about live issues. These women were fighting for a balance of life and work we have yet to define. It's something we engage with as members of the Townswomen's Guilds. They were fighting against the gender pay gap, lazy prejudice and stereotyping. When I asked a group of professional women recently whether they still felt like outsiders, the response was varied. Some had recently qualified, others were at the end of an illustrious career. Many considered themselves beneficiaries of a battle already won, others were not so sure. It can still take courage for a woman to admit an ambition to join the professional elite. The senior partner in a high profile firm of London solicitors confessed that she had to be pushed by a male colleague into applying for the position. She was too modest, feeling herself to be an imposter despite years of training, decades of experience. Women still have to be asked to dance, she told me a little sadly. As the wife and mother of medics, I have endless, timeless tales of discrimination to tell. At an academic conference recently, I listened to first-hand accounts of underrepresentation and breathtaking gender bias. It comes too easily, perhaps, to many of us to think generically of architects, eminent architects, engineers, even consultant surgeons as male. And senior women at the Inns of Court are still called master. I haven't even touched on the marriage bar, which forbade married women from working away from home, though there's plenty about it in the book. But I'm sure you've heard or even experienced stories like mine when I was interviewed as a young woman for a job with a well-known firm of antiquarian booksellers and was asked to prove to the gentleman sitting on the other side of the interview desk that employing me would not be a waste of time and money given that I was likely to get pregnant. There was much consternation when the principal of a women's college in Oxford announced to its governing body that she would like to get married. No one had thought to change the statutes since the place was founded in 1879 when principals didn't couldn't marry in post. She was obliged to resign as a miss before her wedding day before reapplying as a missus after the honeymoon. This was not in the 1930s, it wasn't even the 1950s, this was 1991. Talk of marriage brings me back to Gwyneth Bebb Thompson, the young lawyer that we met at the beginning of this talk. Thanks to her engaging personality and extraordinary flair for her work, it was impossible to deny, you'll remember that Gwyneth was accepted by Lincoln's Inn to read for the bar as a married woman just days after her first daughter was born. She was quite capable of being a working mother with the help of her husband, and that's what she was, a true pioneer, until taken into hospital during her second pregnancy in 1921. There were fears that the baby might be premature. She confessed to her sister in the course of her work for the Ministry of Food that she'd been leaping about the country in the most awful heat we've ever had and baby doesn't like it apparently, she said. Gwyneth suffered from placenta previa and hemorrhaged during labour. Baby Marion died two days after she was born and Gwyneth two months later. To those who thought her attempt to become a barrister ridiculous, and there were plenty of them, her fate was sad, ironic even, given that she died in the ultimate feminine way. But it was hardly surprising and a waste of a damn good training. The rest of us can only admire her. She almost had it all. Today, Gwyneth is celebrated as a heroine of Lincoln's Inn and a powerful role model. She's still inspiring her daughter's descendants, and so is her husband. Throughout the century since the passing of the SDRA, admiring families up and down the country 
have quietly supported daughters, sisters, wives and mothers seeking to realise their potential in their professional workplace. Their numbers have increased and continue to do so, both in real terms and in proportion to their male counterparts, though it's perhaps unlikely that the women in this book would congratulate us on the pace of that change. In 2019, more than half the medical students in Britain were women, as were more than half of the solicitors in practice. Role models are desperately important to us as individuals because they challenge received wisdom and they show us how important it is to strive for things that we assume are beyond reach. Gradually, person by person and institution by institution, habits alter and expectations grow. The quest for equality is a long game and we're playing it still. But it's much easier to join in with things than to start them, to be a participant than a pioneer. To keep us going, we now have proof of something the pioneers could never be quite sure of because they hadn't done it yet. But ladies can climb ladders as high as you like. Thank you very much. <laughs>